There was a man who had two sons. The younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of the property that will belong to me. And so he divided his property between them. A few days later, the younger son gathered all he had and traveled to a distant country. And there he squandered his property in dissolute living. When he had spent everything, a severe famine took place throughout that country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country, who sent him to his fields to feed the pigs. He would gladly have filled himself with the pods that the pigs were eating, and no one gave him anything. But... When he came to himself, he said, How many of my father's hired hands have bread enough and to spare? But here I am, dying of hunger. I will get up and go to my father, and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me like one of your hired hands. So he set off and went to his father. But while he was still far off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion. He ran and put his arms around him and kissed him. Then the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But... The father said to his slaves, Quickly, bring out a robe, the best one, and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet, and get the fatted calf and kill it, and let us eat and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to celebrate. Now his elder son was in the field. And when he came and approached the house, he heard music and dancing. He called one of the slaves and asked what was going on. He replied, your brother has come. Your father has killed the fatted calf because he's got him back safe and sound. And then he became angry and refused to go in. His father came out and began to plead with him. But he answered his father, listen, for all these years I have been working like a slave for you and I have never disobeyed your command. Yet you have never given me even a young goat so that I might celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours comes back, who has devoured your property with prostitutes, you killed the fatted calf for him. And the father said to him, Son, You are always with me, and all that is mine is yours. But we had to celebrate and rejoice, because this brother of yours was dead and has come to life. He was lost and has been found. For we seek to listen for your voice in your word. Amen.
Well, thank you for the welcome. Uh, as Jenny has said, my name's John, and yes, I'm a friend of June, which I hope stands me in good stead in this company. Um, I was last with her a few weeks ago. Um, she preached for our church when I was off down the road for our United Reformed Church friends, and we had a lovely lunch together. She seems on good form, so uh, um, I'm glad you were so good to her when she was with you. Um, why on earth am I here? Well, because you invited me, which is very kind. It was quite a straightforward yes for me, partly because I already know this beautiful place. But that does mean I come with baggage. Um, part of the baggage is a lovely fellow called Terry. Uh, Terry Gill, who was master of the juniors at the, uh, the local school for many years. Terry and Glennis moved here in 1966, they tell me. Um, Terry is my, uh, my uncle, uh, my mum's brother, and so I occasionally came, uh, came here as a child. Um, certainly remember a, a lovely week here one time. Once they had their girls, I, uh, there wasn't quite room for me in the house, so I was in the caravan for the week. Wonderful. As a young teen, that was a great thing to do. Uh, but that does mean I bring baggage. I need to do a straw poll. Where am I? Am I in Southwell? Am I in Southall? <laughs> so you see, the Southwells have it, but forgive me, I grew up calling it Southall. Um, so if I lapse, um, I, you know, let's just pretend I'm at Southwell Baptist Church, which is in a lovely place called Southall in Nottinghamshire, um, and we'll see how we get on. Um, so that's me. What are we looking at together today? Well, uh, I, as my sort of the basis of what I want to say today, I'm using a, a book that came out, my goodness, 30 years or so ago now, uh, which is just another way of saying I'm getting on. Um, the Return of the Prodigal Son by Henry Nouwen. So just a moment or two about um, who Nouwen was. And first off, apparently he did like to be called Henry Nouwen. I, I tried as a young man to, to make him sound very French, Henri. But no, Henry Nouwen was how he was known, not least because he spent a lot of his academic career in the States. But Henry was a, uh, a Dutch Catholic priest and academic, born in 1932. He died sadly young at the age of 64 in 96. His academic interests were in the overlap of psychology and theology. He trained for the priesthood, but then uh, they wanted him to do a doctorate, and he decided to do his doctorate in psychology. And so he had a lifelong fascination with how we tick as humans created in the image and likeness of God. And he held quite prestigious teaching posts at uh, Yale, at uh, Notre Dame, and at uh, Harvard in the States. And even spent some time, considered, he considered entering a monastery. He spent some time at the monastery that uh, the um, famous writer Thomas Merton had been a brother at. But eventually, that wasn't quite for him. And towards the end of his life, he didn't realize it was going to be towards the end of his life. He entered a very different community. He became part of the L'Arche Daybreak community in Canada. Um, L'Arche, um, a Christian community, deliberately helping people with very profound disabilities to live in community together and with others. And he took up a post effectively as chaplain to the community. He went from teaching these fiercely, um, proudly intelligent academic students to working alongside some of our society's most marginalized and often forgotten and neglected people. And some of his writing, some of his best writing, is reflection on how, what he learnt from them by living in community with them. Although I did find some interesting stuff on the internet. There's a wonderful little um, clip of one of his dear friends from the community talking about his life and his, uh, his influence 
saying that actually he was not at all easy to live in community with. Uh, the sort of person who would be up early in the morning banging the, uh, the doors and um, uh, making noises with the plumbing before everyone else was up. But, um. So that's Henry Nowen, who is our conversation partner this weekend. And if you get the chance to read this book, I, I do want to warmly recommend it to you. Um, by the time we're finished today, you won't have, ex you won't have experienced anything like even a, a fifth of what's in here. It's a, it's a, a, a glorious book. Um, but the book itself is a conversation with the famous parable that we've read, but also with this painting. Um, I don't think I need to explain to you that this is a copy. Um, the, uh, I, I didn't even try approaching the uh, Hermitage Museum in St. Petersburg to see if they'd lend it to us for the weekend. If they had, I'm told it's, it's, it's much bigger than this. It's a vast canvas. And it's painted by, um, by Rembrandt, uh, one of the great Dutch artists of the 17th century, um, part of the golden age of Dutch painting. And Nouwen encountered initially that section of the painting as it was produced in a poster. And he, he was visiting a friend in her office and... Uh, this poster was on the back of the door, and he, he was just distracted the whole time. He'd never really encountered this painting before, and he wanted to know more about it. And so he began a journey of exploration with this painting that actually led him to sit for a couple of days in the museum, the, the Hermitage in uh, St. Petersburg, in one of those rare moments in the last hundred years when it was still open to uh, tourists. Um, and he, he just fell in love with the picture, but also with what he was encountering in there about Rembrandt himself and, and Nouwen's own journey and story. I mean, one example, this is not Rembrandt's first go at painting this story. Um, so many of the Golden Age artists were painting Bible themes on a regular basis. And uh, early in his life, there's a, a, a little drawing of it in the book, early in his life, he drew another version of this story as a self-portrait. Rembrandt pictured himself in a, a very fine hat, looking like he'd spent just a little too long in his cups with a glass of something on the go, and uh, a, a young lady sat on his knee um, in what is clearly intended to be one of the brothels of Amsterdam. Um, this is the young son um, off spending in his, in his inheritance in dissolution, and, uh, and that was how Rembrandt came at the story as a young man. But this, this is, this is different. This is the older artist. This is actually quite near the end of his life. And he's reflecting on the story in such a different way. As we have the, uh, the father embracing the son and the onlookers, including this very distinctive onlooker in red, like his father's red, the elder brother of the story, who we will get to later on today. This picture, this story, captivated now. And so we will spend a little bit of time traveling with him through this story too. And of course, at the heart of what we're doing, we are wrestling with the story that Jesus told. Uh, Luke chapter 15 is actually a chapter of three stories of lostness. We have the, the lost sheep and the lost coin and the lost son. We usually call it the prodigal son, the wasteful or wastefully extravagant son. But in the context of the chapter, it's clearly about lostness, not profligacy. And We'll look more at that tomorrow morning in our morning service. We'll look at the three parables of lostness. 
But one of the things we're going to explore today is what it's like to be this lost child. And then perhaps ask whether or not the elder brother is just as lost as the younger one. So that's where we're going. Spoiler alert. And we notice, perhaps, that these stories are told. We'll discuss this further tomorrow. But there's a very... There's a particular reason why these stories are told by Jesus. It's in response to the beginning of the chapter. Now, all the tax collectors and sinners were coming near to listen to Jesus. And the Pharisees and the scribes were grumbling and saying, This fellow welcomes sinners and eats with them. So Jesus told them a parable. Uh, Remember, parables are... They're not simply folk tales or stories just for, the, uh, for, for entertainment. Parables are stories told to make a point. Um, I used to think like referring to them as stories with a punchline. And um, I've never boxed, so forgive me if this is an, in, an inelegant expression. But it's a punchline that's a, it's a low blow. The, the, the parable suddenly comes in with an unexpected meaning. We think we know where it's going, and then suddenly something changes. Our story, our parable, our focus, begins with a, uh, well, with a remarkably straightforward sentence in our Bibles that that is filled with meaning and importance. Father, give me my share of the property that will belong to me. Let me read to you a section from Henry's book as we uh, begin our reflections on the importance of that. He said to his father, let me have the share of the estate that will come to me. And then he got together everything he had received and left. The evangelist Luke tells it all so simply and so matter-of-factly that it's difficult to realize fully what is happening here. What is happening here is an unheard-of event. Hurtful, offensive, in radical contradiction to the most venerated tradition of the time. Kenneth Bailey, in his penetrating explanation of Luke's story, shows that the son's manner of leaving is tantamount to wishing his father dead. Uh, Kenneth Bailey was a writer who traveled in um, communities across the Middle and Near East, um, trying to learn from cultures that he thought would have still resonance with the cultures of Jesus' day so that he could try and understand some of the Bible stories better. Bailey writes, For over 15 years I've been asking people of all walks of life, from Morocco to India, from Turkey to the Sudan, about the implications of a son's request for his inheritance while the father is still living. And the answer has always been emphatically the same. The conversation runs as follows. Has anyone ever made such a request in your village? Never. Could anyone ever make such a request? Impossible. If anyone ever did, what would happen? His father would beat him, of course. Why? The request means he wants his father to die. Bailey explains that the son asks not only for the division of the inheritance, but for the right to dispose of his part. After signing over his possessions to his son, the father still has the right to live off the proceeds as long as he's alive. Here, the younger son gets and thus is assumed to have demanded disposition to which even more explicitly he has no right until the death of his father. The implication of father, I cannot wait for you to die 
underlies both requests. The son's leaving is therefore a much more offensive act than it seems at first reading. It is a heartless rejection of the home in which the son was born and nurtured and a break with the most precious tradition carefully upheld by the larger community of which he was a part. When Luke writes and left for a distant country, he indicates much more than the desire of a young man to see more of the world. He speaks about a drastic cutting loose from a way of living, thinking, and acting that has been handed down to him from generation to generation as a sacred legacy. More than disrespect, it is a betrayal of treasured values of family and community. The distant country is the world in which everything considered at home as holy is disregarded. This is a despicable thing to do. Fortunately, we live in a world where our children never disappoint us. And we were never a disappointment to our parents. We need to see just how hurtful this act of leaving is. The son burns his bridges and then wastes everything. And remember, this is a Jewish story. He ends up taking work for a local landowner, feeding the pigs. I mean, could he have got any lower than that? In fact, not only is he feeding the pigs, he is so hungry that he's beginning to wish he could eat what the pigs are eating. This boy is lost. He is lonely. He's burnt his bridges. He has no way back. Except we know where the story's going. Um, I, you're, you're sat in tables, which is probably means you're in, in the right sort of group to spend some time in discussion together. And I've put a few questions in front of you, just on this little bit. We'll spend a time just talking about these questions, and then I'll take it on with the next part of the talk. But I've, I've wondered whether you might like to reflect on one or all of these questions. In what ways have you been tempted to rebel in the way that this younger son did? I know you're all good folk. I know you wouldn't do that. But in what ways have you been tempted to just give it all up, take it all and run away? And if you're wondering about that, then maybe it's worth reflecting on what is home to you? What are the, some of the voices calling you away from home? What are the things that make you think, oh, I don't want to stay here. I need to be away. I need to be doing something different. Any of you old enough to remember Cat Stevens? I love his song, Father and Son, where you have this song of, well, musically, it works almost like two very different tunes, two different songs, as the, the father sing, sings about his love for his son and how he's got everything he needs here, and the son is just, I need to be somewhere else. And that's what we've got in this story. Have you ever had feelings like that, temptation to, to run away? And how do you suppose the son feels in this story? How is he feeling before he asks his father? How is, he feel, how is he feeling when he's spending all the money? <laughs> and skipping on, how do you suppose he might have felt once he was back home? So spend some time with, with those questions, if you will. Uh, yeah, maybe 10 minutes or so, if that's okay. I'll, I'll try and gauge how you're looking, see whether you're, 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 you're getting on or whether you, you need some help. But uh, is that all right? You, 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 you're okay with that? Good. It's a good sign. <clears throat> the 
So, in the spirit of still telling you things about myself, because why wouldn't I? Um, I grew up in North Derbyshire, in a little place called Chapel and the Frith, so that is home for me. And the first time I was properly away from home was university, which took me to Nottingham, so not a million miles from here. In fact, I remember coming over here, you know, notice I'm trying to avoid saying <coughs> the name, um, as a student uh, to visit Uncle Terry in his class and he uh, provided me with two of his students to take me for a tour of the Minster in a way that would not be appropriate in today's educational setting, but was fabulous as these two bright young things. If it was you, then, you know, no, um, you know lovely to show me your beautiful uh, Minster church. Um, well, I stayed in Nottingham for about nine years, and um, I was part of a church there called Cornerstone Evangelical Church. Um, I went there for the first time, my second week at the university. My first week, I'd gone along to the Methodist church because I was a, a Methodist in those days. I remember writing home to mother that I'd heard a sermon on salvation by good works according to the Socialist Worker Party. I was not impressed. I have to say I would have probably been far more impressed with that sermon today than I was then, but yeah, there we go. Um, so I, I was looking for something else. I, that evening I went to the, uh, the, the big evangelical Anglican church in the centre of town where the Huggets were in those days, Joyce and, I can't remember his name. But anyway, they, they, were, they were big names in, and, and it just didn't do it for me, St. Nick's. The following week I got taken to um, the, the huge Assemblies of God church, Talbot Street. I mean, I thought I'd gone into a different world. We, it was an upstairs church. As we came up the stairs, oh my goodness, the city was wonderful. But again, it wasn't really me. And then that evening, I went to Cornerstone, which in those days was in the old Rally Street Social Club. Uh, they'd sold the Palin Street Baptist Church many years earlier, and they were in that sort of bit of... Um, uh, Radford, is it? But anyway, you know, sort of just outside the city centre, it was a bit grotty, if I'm honest. And um, we were in this little low ceiling social club, and I heard this Welshman preach with a passion and a conviction and an understanding of the scriptures that I fell in love with. And I was a disciple of Peter Lewis for many years after that. Sadly, he died just a few years ago. But I remember Peter saying often in sermons, and I think he'd probably learnt it from Martin Lloyd-Jones, another great Welsh preacher, whenever you see the word but in the text, pay attention. Notice the buts. Notice those moments of change of direction in the text. But... When he came to himself, he said, how many of my father's hired hands have bread enough? And so he, he creates this amazing speech for himself. You can almost imagine him rehearsing the speech every step of the way home. Uh, father, I have sinned against heaven and before you I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me like one of your hired hands. He has he's found a way back, not to being a son, but at least to having something to eat. He's not really going home because home doesn't exist anymore. He just knows his father is a good man and will treat him well, or at least he hopes he will. But, and then notice the next but. But while he was still far off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion. How does he see him whilst he's still far off? Has this father stood there every day, watching, waiting, hoping? This son who has cut him dead, he's still his son. And he still hopes that maybe, just maybe, but while he was still far off, his father saw him and filled with compassion, ran and put his arms around him and kissed him. 
and then the speech comes out. Father, I've sinned against heaven and before you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son, but the father. I, I, almost, I almost feel there should be a, a slightly more earthy Derbyshire expression in there. Let's, let's, let's just simply say nonsense. You know, as the father cuts him off, he, 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 this isn't, you're not going to be my servant. You're my son. But the father said to his slaves, quickly bring out a robe. Now, look, look at our painting again. Uh, I think it's very you know, noticeable. The father and the elder son are wearing matching robes. Whereas the young son, I mean, that's, for, for, for 17th century, that's basically undergarments. He has been stripped of everything worth selling. Or, or except, there's one detail that I'm so glad that now I'm pointed out to me because I wouldn't have noticed. But if you look carefully on the picture, he's still wearing a short sword. And that's strange because that was probably something he could have sold. He could have, you know, he could have made good money from that. But I guess that was the one thing that still spoke to him of his status as a son. It's still the one thing that says, I'm, I'm, I'm somebody. It's, there's something about that that just... But, but I mean, the rest of the clothes are rags. Um, I mean, look at the shoes. One's fallen off. Yeah, he, he's, he's disheveled. And the father says, quick, bring out a robe, the best one, and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger, sandals on his feet. Get the fatted calf and kill it. Let us eat and celebrate, for this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to celebrate. There's not much celebration in this painting. I think Rembrandt had done the, the celebrating in his first try. But here you have instead that sense of He's at home. The father's embrace. We'll come back to the brother's expression later. But, you know, the speech, the speech is gone. He's thrown himself at his father's feet. The speech is done and the father, the father welcomes him home. An exuberant welcome in contrast with the prepared statement of apology. Is it an apology? Is it repentance? Let me read you something of what uh, Nowen reflects on this part. The prodigal's return is full of ambiguities. He is traveling in the right direction, but what confusion. He admits that he was unable to make it on his own and confesses that he would get better treatment as a slave in his father's home than as an outcast in a foreign land. But he's still far from trusting his father's love. He knows that he is still the son, but tells himself that he's lost the dignity to be called son and prepares himself to accept the status of a hired man so that he will at least survive. There is repentance, but not a repentance in the light of the immense love of a forgiving God. It is a self-serving repentance that offers the possibility of survival. I know this state of mind and heart quite well, writes Nowen. It is like saying, well, I couldn't make it on my own. I have to acknowledge that God is the only resource left to me. I will go to God and ask for forgiveness in the hope that I will receive a minimum punishment and be allowed to survive on the condition, on the condition of hard labor. We ever felt like that before? God remains a harsh, judgmental God. It is this God who makes me feel guilty and worried and calls up in me all these self-serving apologies. Submission to this God does not create true inner freedom 
but breeds only bitterness and resentment. One of the greatest challenges of the spiritual life is to receive God's forgiveness. There is something in us humans that keeps us clinging to our sins and prevents us from letting God erase our past and offer us a completely new beginning. Sometimes it even seems as though I want to prove to God that my darkness is too great to overcome. While God wants to restore me to the full dignity of sonship, I keep insisting that I will settle for being a hired servant. But do I truly want to be restored to the full responsibility of the son? Do I truly want to be so totally forgiven that a completely new way of living becomes possible? Do I trust myself and such a radical reclamation? Do I want to break away from my deep-rooted rebellion against God and surrender myself so absolutely to God's love that a new person can emerge? Receiving forgiveness requires a total willingness to let God be God and do all the healing, restoring, and renewing. As long as I want to do even a part of that myself, I end up with partial solutions, such as becoming a hired servant. As a hired servant, I can still keep my distance, still revolt, reject, strike, run away, or complain about my pay. As the beloved son, I have to claim my full dignity and begin preparing myself to become the father. Spoiler alert, that's where Henry Nouwen goes in his exploration of this story. He, he learns to journey from seeing himself as the son who needs to be forgiven to becoming the father who offers forgiveness to others. Because that is our Christian journey and our Christian story. We, we begin as those who need to be forgiveness and receive forgiveness, but we need to receive it so, in such a way that we are fully restored and remade and recreated so that we can offer forgiveness to others, so that we can share that love onwards. We see in this story the son journeying through repentance, yes, but to restoration. Not some half-hearted solution, not some partial recompense, but once again, part of the family. And notice the exuberant celebration. The older boy will notice this. Notice how unbaptist it is. All that partying, dancing, I mean, I ask you. But notice the exuberance of the welcome. And ask yourself, is that the God I believe in? Is that the God I experience? Uh, one of my favorite writers when I was a young teenager was uh, Adrian Plass. Uh, do you remember uh, some of his stories and, uh, and books? I remember hearing him speak once, and he was trying to describe what God was like to Adrian Plass at his worst. And he said he, in his mind, God was sort of a, a cross between a, a head teacher and a bank manager. Apologies to any head teachers and bank managers present. Um, but a, a cross between a head teacher and a bank manager. And, and, and he was just a naughty schoolboy with a huge overdraft. And that was how he felt in the presence of God. God was there to smite. God was there to chastise. God was there to correct. Adrian Plass talks about how he learned to see God differently. Will we? Will we learn from this story to see God as the waiting, watching father? The father who knows that he's been wronged, but who is waiting 
wanting, longing to forgive. And not just to forgive, but to restore. What will our Christian lives be like if we take this God seriously? We need to become children again in the presence of God. And this is hard. Um, there's something about this, uh, this painting that um, some people notice. I, I have to say, when I look at him, one of the first things I see when I see the shaved head is, um, is that sense of shame. Um, don't watch this unless you're of a strong disposition, but there's a, uh, a new film out at the moment with Kate Winslet called Lee. Have you seen it? About this incredible... Um, uh, war correspondent. It's not for the faint-hearted. Um, amongst other things, she takes photographs at, um, at one of the uh, concentration camps, one of the death camps um, in the war. Um, but in that, you've got scenes of um, women who have been thought to be collaborating with the, uh, with, with the Germans, having their heads shaved. It's a sign of, of shame. It's a way of being shamed. And, and here we have this shaven-headed figure, which some, like I say, some see a Holocaust survivor in that. Some see the shamed person in that. Some see the little baby in that. Um, so, some see a head that almost, you've all done it, I hope. That moment when you're in the presence of a young a young one, and you, you just want to stroke that head. With that, that little fuzz, that early... Uh, some, some see in this the, the, the baby-like moment. Um, which, however you see it, there is something in this story about our shame and our need forgiveness, yes, but also something about needing to recover ourselves as young children in the presence of the Father who loves us, the parent who will not let us go but Jesus does not ask us to remain a child writes Nouwen Jesus not, not, does not ask me to remain a child but to become a child to go back to start again but then to grow with him and in him in his love and his forgiveness so that's the start of our exploration of this story, this picture, our feelings. Is there anything you want to ask or to say? Maybe there was something that came up in the tables you just wanted to, to share with the group. We've just got a few moments before I think we're off for coffee next. I'm looking for Jennifer. Yep. So is there anything anyone wanted to ask or to say? Yes. Yeah. There, there is something here that is, it's, it's very countercultural. Um, so the, the father, as portrayed here, is not portrayed the way that people would have expected the father to be portrayed. And that's this business of the parable being a story with a punchline that comes in unexpectedly. Um, the people hearing this story for the first time, what would they have expected the father to do? They would have expected the father, even this moderately reasonable request to be a servant, a hired hand, is thoroughly unreasonable. You have disgraced the family. You have, you know, you've taken everything, you've wasted it. Go away. He loved him enough to, to give him what he wanted, not necessarily what he needed. Again, we are all responsible adults. We, you know, would, we have, would we have done that? Would we have, uh, you know, would we have sold half the land to realize the assets? To, to? Probably not. I would have had to talk to my financial advisor and take, you know. No, we, we're shown a picture of a father who 
strangely, is probably as prodigal as the son. There's a sense in which the father is wasteful of his wealth and wasteful of his love. Profligate, prodigal, to use that word. And and that's our father, our God, the one who gave his only begotten son because God so loved the world. God knew that there would be swathes of the world that would never, never turn to him and and even if they did, would probably turn away from him. God knew. God knows what we're like. And so, yes, there is something amazing in this portrayal that would have been very countercultural. Uh, yeah, yeah, it's it, it's 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 horrible, and he takes it. He is the one. Yeah, he is the one who, through that, brings the healing and restoration to the son. I mean, we don't know. I mean, I, I asked you to think maybe about what it feels like to be the son at this point. I think Henry Nowen is 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 grasping at this that. Actually, it's hard work being forgiven because we don't think we are worth it. We don't think we deserve it. Um, And I think that's probably the hardest bit of being a Christian is actually coming to terms with the fact that God loves us radically, wonderfully, abundantly, generously Um, I think our churches would be different places if we were all people who knew knew deep down knew with every fiber of our being that we were loved I think that would you know it transforms families when children know that they are loved and secure Imagine how it would be for churches. More of that after the break. Um, I, I, Jenny, are we simply going through and, 